Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining our expert panel on resilience. My name is Valeria Pustorino Supan. I am the chair for the Future Leaders Group of CTBUH Florida. Um, we want to thank Master of Science Construction Management Program of the College of Engineering of University of Miami for hosting this webinar. Uh, we want to, to have um, as many people as possible participating to the event. So use the question and answer section. We will read your questions. We'll go through them um, during the session. A brief introduction about CTBUH. The Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat was founded in 1969. It is a nonprofit multidisciplinary association focused on tall buildings and sustainable cities. As of this year, 2020, the member network includes more than 2 million individual members working in more than 10,000 offices around the world. Among the members, we have developers, engineering firms, architectural firms, construction management and project management firms, um, materials and system suppliers, contractors, um, associations, government um, organization, universities, and other consultants. They are spread all over the world with the majority of members present in North America. The research division of CTBUH issues volumes um, on um, covering topics that are relevant for our industry. Here are some of the subjects. We are covering resilience today, um, but should you be interested in any of these topics, please feel free to go to our website, www.ctbuh.org, uh, and download your copy. Among other initiatives, CTBUH sponsors competitions. Um, whether for research or student, what, if you're interested, more information is available on the website. The association has a global reach with presence in over 41, um, in 41 countries with um, three offices in Chicago, in Shanghai, in Venice, Italy, um, and 13 chapters. Our group, the Florida group, is led by Christoph and Danilo together with Dean, Marco, and Mindy. This year, we also started the Future Leaders Group, which I am chairing together with Santiago, with Hari, with Elizabeth, Sergio, and Jorge. We would love for you to participate to our events. Um, the 2020 program is featuring the Nativo Tower, Yokan Tower, the Flatiron, and other structures that are relevant for the South Florida landscape. We would also be hosting in-person industry networking events, but we're moving them online, so we'll, we'll, we will be able to mingle enjoying a glass of wine from home. Our chapter also partners with universities uh, for student mentorship events, as well as webinars, as the one we're hosting today. Without further ado, um, I am leaving the stage to Santiago, who is going to moderate our panel. Uh, is going to introduce our panelists and I want to thank all of them for participating to this and discussing, bringing their experience to our resilience um, conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Valeria. That was a great introduction and setting the stage for a, an excellent panel. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Spencer Crowley to introduce himself uh, right now. Sorry, I was on mute. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Spencer Crowley. I'm a uh, land use and environmental attorney here in Miami. Um, I do a lot of uh, marine uh, permitting work as a lawyer uh, for my day job. Uh, I'm also a commissioner on the Florida Inland Navigation District. Uh, this is an independent district of the state of Florida that manages the Intracoastal Waterway and provides grants to uh, local governments like Miami-Dade County and City of Miami for waterfront uh, improvements like uh, living shorelines and seawalls that are obviously a big part of resilience. Uh, and finally, I'm also a, a board member on the Downtown Development Authority. And the DDA is very uh, interested in 
looking at how they can incorporate resiliency measures into the downtown area uh, to help make that uh, part of the city uh, more, more sustainable. So thanks for having me, look forward to this. Thank you, Spencer. I would like to invite Jeffrey to introduce himself. Hello, my name is Jeff Suter. I work with a firm up in Fort Lauderdale called EDSA. I'm a principal there. We're a planning and landscape architecture firm. Um, pretty much through our history, we turned 60 this year. We've had a lot of projects that are along the coastal line in Florida and throughout all the islands in the world. So we encounter resiliency and the need to be respectful for that on pretty much all our projects. So it's, it's, a, it's a great topic. It's a great time to be discussing this as we move forward in the future. So I look forward to everybody's questions and, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Dr. Asper, please introduce yourself. Uh, good evening. Uh, uh, first, thank you very much for this opportunity and partnership, Santiago and Valeria, uh, for hosting this event uh, together with us today. So I'm Esber Anderoglu. I'm an associate professor of practice, environmental civil, architect, and environmental engineer, um, as well as um, uh, with a secondary appointment uh, at SCO Architecture. Are you all able to hear me? I'm getting a message that maybe my sound may be poor. Santiago, could you chime uh, in? The sound is coming in a little muffled. If you want to speak just a little slower, it may, it may be improving. All right. So, so let me restart then. So I'm um, the Esberon de Roglu. I am an associate professor of practice in uh, Department of Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering with a secondary appointment at School of Architecture. I'm also the director of the Master of Science in Construction Management program offered by College of Engineering. I am currently engaged in a number of resiliency focused uh, research projects, many of uh, which are with community ties um, in our region and very much excited to uh, get engaged in uh, discussions with everyone this evening. Uh, thank you, doctor. Uh, I would like to have Janik introduce himself. Thank you, Santiago. Again, my name is uh, Yannick Cedarberg. Uh, I'm a principal of uh, Cummins Cedarberg. We are a coastal and marine engineering firm uh, here in uh, Florida with offices in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Jupiter, and Tallahassee. Uh, I'm a licensed engineer, uh, background in coastal and civil engineering. Uh, I'm originally from Denmark, but I've been in, uh, in Miami now for 17 years. Um, I have 20 years of experience in, in this area here, involved in design permitting analysis of uh, uh, coastal and, and marine environments. I've been involved in uh, waterfront projects, beaches, marinas, seawalls, piers, and ports, and, and that kind. So my entry to the resiliency is mostly related to storm impacts and, and sea level rise. How do we work with, uh, with nature and how do we adapt uh, while still protecting our infrastructure uh, and still having accessible waterfront. Um, so we have been involved in that in, in Florida, uh, a lot in the Caribbean, uh, various vulnerability studies and, and design. Uh, I've also been the uh, lead engineer on uh, all the sea level rise planning for most of my immediate counties. Um, uh, major waterfront parks, uh, as well as uh, various other uh, large infrastructure projects here in, uh, in South Florida. Uh, thank you, Janik. Uh, and last but not least, Dr. Mohammed. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you for having us. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to share our knowledge and kind of disseminate all our backgrounds to the community. So let me start with uh, I'm currently an assistant professor of Florida International University at College of Engineering and Computing, and I teach at the Moss School of Construction, Infrastructure, and Sustainability. Uh, I received my PhD from Arizona State University, and you can imagine that's one of the leading universities that kind of focuses on resiliency and sustainability, and they're number one in the nation in terms of innovation, which takes me to my next set, section, which is basically, I look at anything in terms of innovation. How can we be more innovative in terms of how we look at resiliency, sustainability, how can we design, how can we address the issues that the community is basically facing 
I do have a um, two master's degree as well, one in architecture from University of Arizona and another one from construction engineering from American University in Cairo. Uh, I very much focus on sustainability. I have a lot of funded projects there in that region as well. So, and engineering education has always been my passion. I've been in industry for almost 15 years, working in construction management, delivering multi-million projects in different sectors. You name them, whether it's school, universities. Uh, I did office buildings, office parks, uh, retail. So I've been kind of everywhere in terms of development and construction management. Uh, I very much like to integrate health and well-being to every discussion because I think the human perspective is the major component that kind of dictates how we think of different issues. And again, thank you for having me and I'm looking forward to the discussion. All right, thank you very much everyone. Um, I would like to again open up the lines of communication to our attendees and if you have any questions during our dialogue, please uh, don't feel afraid to write them down in the Q&A and we'll get to them as we go along. I'd like to get started with a very simple and maybe not as easy to answer, but what is resilience and how does it relate to South Florida? So why don't we start with you, Spencer? Sorry. Um, I think resilience is the ability of a community to, um, you know, adapt to changes and mostly negative changes in a way that uh, is not too disruptive to uh, the infrastructure or the economy or the social fabric of the region. Um, here in South Florida, obviously, um, we're facing an unprecedented uh, threat from sea level rise. And so uh, the discussion now of resilience is really how do we um, redesign our, our region uh, to accommodate for that uh, natural occurrence. And um, so there's a lot of different ways that we need to be, um, you know, looking at this, a lot of different um, uh, alternatives that need to be considered. Uh, but certainly uh, the stormwater system is one uh, element of that that's very important, needs to be redesigned. Uh, and we're talking from just your local uh, system, uh, draining streets to the regional system. Uh, that is uh, the central and southern Florida flood control project, uh, which is likely to get a second look here pretty soon by Army Corps of Engineers. Um, another, another, you know, big component of that is um, coastal hardening and coastal um, strength, strengthening. So that's any, anything from beach nourishment to um, higher seawalls to um, natural based um, features along the shoreline, which um, help dissipate wave activity and prevent from uh, damage from coastal storms. Thank you, thank you for your answer. Um, let me see, Dr. Esper, uh, how does this affect me and the construction industry? Well, um, you know, I agree with what Spencer just summarized, but what I would like to add or emphasize is that resilience, especially in our region right now, it is a very complex issue where um, it is really an interdisciplinary, multidimensional uh, issue where the response to or answers to resiliency needs can't come from one dimension or one uh, focus area. So Spencer touched on a lot of those and um, often uh, public community engagement interaction um, is, is key. So from the academic side, from the academia, and Mohammed is my colleague here as well with us as well, uh, I think our focus often is really how do we um, get to uh, our community? Um, can you all hear me actually? Uh, can someone verify how is my sound? Because I had some trouble earlier. I can hear you. Okay. Um, so often what we find is that the uh, response from the community is tied in hand in hand with um, the skill sets that are in the community from the practicing professionals, the next generation of professionals that are 
bring into the community who are going to undertake a lot of these tasks and challenges. So from the academic side, from the academia, it is our duty to prepare the next generation um, with the tools to tackle them. So uh, what are those tools? So one thing we're often finding out that the traditional response systems, the traditional way we're building buildings, the use of materials, design concepts, are, may no longer be as effective or as productive or as efficient. Given the technological advancements, it's very timely that we adopt some of those and really uh, end up deploying uh, them as opportunities for the next generation of professionals to adapt and bring it into our place and then uh, enforcers, the regulators, the policy makers, the residents uh, to you know, join in that effort and, and um, deliver that collaboratively structured response uh, mechanism in our communities. So uh, I think academia education again in, is is a key element here, and the burden of getting it done correctly is on us, those of us engaged in academia, and similarly adapting outcomes from very innovative research projects, technical, technological advancements, and merging them into practice. Um, is also something that we really need to think um, very seriously on. And our Master of Science in Construction Management program, actually, that's our primary focus. To, not to do traditional construction management, but to, to um, help our graduates uh, you know, gain ground uh, with this emphasis. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Jeff, let me follow up and maybe you can answer, how does this actually affect us in, in terms of the construction industry? Well, I was going to kind of take it maybe one step further, um, not only just in the construction, construction industry, but uh, through the ownership and a lot of the developers. And so we, we're fortunate that we work with a lot of different people that are either in London, Florida, or from other parts of the country that are coming down to Miami, Fort Lauderdale, throughout the islands. And it really starts with the process of trying to educate the developer and their teams to understand the importance of the resiliency, because in a lot of their areas, they're not dealing with the coastal, um, the coastal concerns or the, the, uh, you know, the threats that we, that we experience down here. So as part of the construction industry, what I've noticed is there is a premium when we start looking at this and how we go about developing. So it becomes very integral that, we work hand in hand, not only with the architect, but with the coastal engineer, the civil engineer, and anybody that kind of has anything to do with the exterior, the site components of it, trying to understand what the finished elevations, what the datum is, what field it's going to be in, if we have to rearmor or rebuild a seawall, at what proper elevation that you have to bring that seawall up because it has an adverse effect on the overall construction. And so going back with the ownership group, you know, there's always that balance or that delicate balance of making sure that they're doing the right thing to protect themselves for the next 50 to 100 years, but then also making sure that through the construction and the means and methods that we do, that we're not affecting things adversely down the pipeline later on. So um, that's just wanted to add to that. Thank you. Thank you for that. I was muted for a second there. Uh, Janik, uh, in, in your field, how, how are we, uh, looking at Miami being impacted in the near future? Um, in, the, in the near future here, we, uh, like obviously there's some impacts now where we see sometimes local, localized tidal uh, flooding in some areas are very low elevation. Um, but where we start seeing it otherwise is on municipal codes, uh, county requirements, for example. Uh, so that's started impacting us in that uh, in that way. It's still uh, we're still in the beginning of of all that, so it's, it's still in the infant stages. But we start seeing in different uh, municipalities, for example, requiring uh, minimum elevations uh, for seawalls, for example, um, and and those kind of things, uh, and similar to like flood elevations and that. So 
in that way, in, in the short term, we're going to st we start seeing it that, that way. Um, then longer term, we uh, my aim is still here. It's going to be impacted by, by this year. But I, I think there's a big difference there than when we start looking outside Miami, looking at other areas of, of Florida. Um, because in, in uh, a lot of areas, the only option you really have is to elevate uh, land, properties, roads. Um, and like uh, Southeast Florida is fortunate to have a very good tax base in, in many areas uh, that can help with that. Uh, but other areas of Florida is not as fortunate. Uh, and, and those areas uh, maybe um, may have some some issues relative to funding some of these improvements that that are required to 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 be done. Uh, so that's that's an area where I see it being being impacted. Right, I I could totally agree with that. I know Spencer that in in your field there's definitely uh, some signs of how this is going to impact in the near future. Maybe you can share some of that. Yeah. And just to kind of follow up on what Yannick was saying, I mean, one of the, one of the ways that it's really coming to fruition here and the rubbers meeting the road is in um, local government ordinances that are now being either adopted or under consideration that are requiring uh, the, the height of the seawalls to be elevated. So uh, Fort Lauderdale was the first, I believe, to do theirs uh, a couple of years back. Broward County just enacted um, their ordinance uh, within the past couple of weeks, I believe. And uh, the city of Miami is uh, uh, in process of um, doing public presentations around the county uh, to various uh, trade groups and you know interested parties to discuss um, their, their new ordinance, which actually is, is you know, drafted and they're, they're sort of sensitizing it, but it's, gonna, it's going to uh, mandate essentially, uh, a, a, I mean, the way it's written now is a two and a half foot increase in the seawall height uh, for any new seawalls. And, and in addition to uh, applicability to new seawalls, it's going to set forth a, sort of a schedule where, um, you know, people who have existing seawalls will need to eventually bring it up to code over some period of time. And so the final um, height that, that the seawalls will be required to go is still a little bit up in the air. Um, I think the, the professional staff have made their recommendation in terms of what they think is needed, but then, you know, it has to go through the political process so that could change things. Um, and, and in addition to that, uh, the, the time at which seawalls will be required to be brought into compliance is also out there as an issue. Um, and one of the interesting elements of that uh, uh, ordinance is that uh, the design standards for the new seawalls will require that they be able to accommodate an additional height at some point in the future. So right now, you know, if you go around the city, uh, there's various types of seawalls, most of which are old and not really capable of, you know, just plopping another two feet of seawall cap on it. But these new seawalls, the standards are, are the, the idea is that they will be designed uh, to be able to structurally um, take that additional, uh, that additional load. And so the two and a half feet actually could be increased to uh, an additional two feet at some point in the future. So that's just one of the ways that this is really coming, um, you know, co coming to fruition and really having uh, an impact. I mean, of course, another another key way this is this is impacting construction right now is in um, the height of, um, you, you know, the finished floor elevation of buildings. And so uh, you're seeing places like Miami Beach requiring it uh, much higher than they have in the past. Yes, that's a, that's a definitely something that we're seeing now um, with the sea level rise. Um, uh, Janik, if you want to jump in on this. Yeah, just to uh, continue to what Spencer was saying, so relative to the seawalls, one, one thing that, that the, the municipalities are, are now are looking at is that it's not necessarily just because your seawall is in a bad condition and you need to raise it. If you, uh, some municipalities that now start requiring it, that if you basically causing flooding, causing flooding on neighboring properties, then you're going to be requiring to raise your 
uh, uh, your seawall. Uh, so, it, it, so it's not like you can just leave it and, and not do anything. Um, so uh, that's kind of a side thing of it. And like some of these um, rules have already been implemented in some areas. Uh, some of them are, are, are very rigid, um, which is also where you sometimes see pushback then from, from locals because uh, if, if, you, if you have a waterfront property and you have a seawall uh, and you just want to do repairs on it, it may be that now with some of these new codes that they it pushes you instead of doing a repair project and now you uh, have to do a replacement project because you're, re you're required to raise the elevation and the old wall that you have may not be able to support just raising the elevation and then uh, you have to uh, put in a new seawall and then it becomes very very expensive. So that's sometimes where there's like a local pushback relative to, to, to these things because it may be somebody that just want, uh, looking at increasing the service life for another 10 years uh, of, of a seawall and, and then suddenly they are forced to look at conditions that are 40 years out, for example. Um, it's something that they don't really want to do that. They would rather do that in 10 years. So that's sometimes when, when the code is a little bit too rigid that you run into those kind of problems. I see that. Uh, let's hear from Mohammed. Uh, in terms of what can I do, this is a question that uh, we've been getting, but what can I do as a student uh, to help with resilience? Okay, let me first of all try to kind of recap everything and kind of interweave between the different points. From an academic point of view, I would like to kind of give another perspective to what resiliency is. I think resiliency has four main properties just for everyone to kind of understand. It's not only one aspect. And again, like what, what Dr. Escobar just said, it, it's very complex. It's, you can't really tackle one angle from it. It's, it's multidimensional, it's interdisciplinary. So let me just give you a quick property. It's robustness, it's rapidity, and redundancy and resourcefulness. Robustness really quickly is basically how do we still deliver service? And if any problems happen, can we still withstand it? Rapidity is going back. So assuming there's a hurricane, it's just gonna hit the city. How fast can we go back to functionality? That's called rapidity. That's another prop, very important property. Then redundancy, what elements can we get we don't really need? What elements are fundamental? Are the bridges more fundamental than the roads? Are inner roads, are dams, are bridges? So all these infrastructure systems, are the infrastructure of the building, are the electricity cables more important than the water sewage system. So it's very complex, but these, this is what called, what, this is what redundancy kind of tackles. Then resourcefulness. It's the capacity and a, that requires basically an appropriate budget available. What are the identifying problems? How can we prioritize these aspects and these prop, properties and how can we tackle them and mobilize these sources? So going back to the same, that's kind of big, very big image of robustness, rapidity, redundancy, and then resourcefulness. As a student, I think it's very important to equip yourself with these technologies, these knowledge, to understand what the industry is gonna require. Again, at FIU, what we basically focus on in our master's or in the undergrad, we try to teach students how basically, I'm gonna just get very simple example. Our productivity rate in construction is very low. We're struggling with that. Look at all the other industries. Talk about automotive. They build a car in minutes, in hours, in a day. How long does it take us to build a structure? It takes forever. So how can we utilize robotics? How can we utilize artificial intelligence? How, this is kind of where I think our students should start thinking. Again, a lot of the speakers we're talking about, two and a half feet, is it gonna go up to three feet, one feet, all this depends on artificial intelligence, modeling factors, anticipation and forecasting these kind of problems that's gonna happen. All these come in from a computer science background. Do we need a computer science in a construction industry? Probably you need that kind of set of mind. It's exactly like equation, one plus one equals two. Is that only for math folks? No, it's for everyone. So it becomes fundamental knowledge. So the more you equip yourself with these technologies and these knowledge, to understand how to tackle that, that is fundamental. 
for practitioners, we always build on their experience. They're actually in the forefront. They are the folks that are building. So we would like to hear their problems and how they think the mitigation factor would come in. So you always want to kind of bridge this gap between academics and professionals and the industry. Otherwise, there's always going to be a gap. I think it's four feet, but the industry believes it's two and a half. Who is right? Which one is right? So that's kind of where we have the debates, where we get folks from the industry to talk to our students. And I think the students, and the professionals, they should kind of always try to learn more. Even us in academia, we always try, we foster that kind of, we embrace that kind of innovation in terms of, yes, we have to learn. A month ago, Zoom was basically for folks across continents. Now everyone is using Zoom, even for my neighbors. I talk with my neighbors with Zoom. So that's kind of how to utilize technology. We're, this is kind of how students, not only students, it's professionals. A lot of us never really, really used Zoom. It was always a conference call. Now it has to be Zoom. Now you have to kind of know when to mute, when to talk, when to ask a question. So this is kind of where I think the topic should come. It's, it's very complex. And the strength is you become more diversified, more open to understanding more concepts, more fundamentals into how to bridge these together. That's kind of very simple. I think it's, it's a very tough topic to kind of capture, but as long as you're trying your best to kind of connect these dots, you should be able to craft something that help you understand a little bit better. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Um, Jeff, uh, if you can elaborate a little bit on how we as professionals and with continuing education, how we can continue to be on the forefront of you know, acting as the stewards of our city, basically, and making sure that it becomes a resilient city and it remains a resilient city. Well, I, th I think, you know, first and foremost, education is the most important thing. I think we need to make sure that as we, as we do things as professionals, as residents, as, you know, patrons of the community, it's always good to understand and educate ourselves. Um, the second you stop doing that, you, you kind of start resorting back to old ways or old practices. And as a professional designer, we, you know, we're always reaching out to the people on the team, whether it's the coastal engineer, the civil engineer, trying to figure that out. Uh, as far as the city goes, you know, being creative, you know, with the sea walls and the, the sea level rise, you know, the king tides, the super moons and everything that's happening out here. That used to be a rare occasion. Now it happens every year and the floods get more and more. Um, as far as the cities as well too, something was touched on earlier about the stormwater management. That's, that's super important to try to figure out how we hold and retain water, making sure that we discharge it properly. Uh, you know, green space is a very important thing. Uh, as, as we move forward, you know, there's always the discussion about what is the footprint that's actually should be on the side? Should, is it better to go more vertical, more so than sprawling out? Um, and then I also think that, you know, with a lot of the different changes within the cities that we talk about the elevation, the finished floor elevation of it, in my world, it becomes very important to try to understand what that relationship is from the at-grade surface and how you, you know, get into the buildings and, and what you do. Grove Isle is a perfect example. You know, it's up at elevation 17, but the rest of the site's down at six, seven, eight. And so how do you make those spaces uh, interrelate with everybody? So I hope that answered it. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, this is a question uh, that may not be uh, easy to, to answer, but what are we doing to mitigate climate change? Aside from the sea level rise, what are we doing to mitigate the high temperatures uh, in terms of building enclosures and what are we doing? And, and I guess the first person to answer this probably be Dr. Esper. Uh, yes, uh, um, Santiago, thank you for that. Um, can, can, we, can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you, can you hear me? me? Are you able to hear uh, me? Santiago, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Santiago, are you able to hear me? 
yes. So this this is uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so this this is uh, again. Uh, what are we doing about another, climate change? Again, this is another very challenging task that we're and facing. Again, and once again, this is not a single solution. Uh, we struggle uh, in community engagement. Education is element element. Uh, in the news recently, um, as a result of the COVID-19 impact, uh, how uh, certain uh, natural uh, elements uh, in our surrounding environments have improved uh, as a result of now uh, trees, business, and um, so therefore awareness of climate change impacts is a key. So I'm going to say what we need to do is start with education. Our focus, Our focus has to be uh, originating from education and how can we spread that to the community? How can we engage the uh, community in this? A lot of the topics that we've been talking about um, has a very high price tag associated with and often uh the, our we can we can still hear you we can still hear you you're still hearing me okay so often um to get the community residents or stakeholders buy to join in this effort uh we must also able to relate to their perspectives and often uh when earlier when i said that climate change or resilience is a multi-dimensional, very interdisciplinary issue. Um, it is also from the perspective of the stakeholders. So we all come from different backgrounds and we often prioritize issues the same way uh, with somebody else, with our neighbors. Um, so I think the way we're approaching community education, the way we're planning of interdisciplinary dimensional solutions and the stakeholders the way that we're going to get everyone engaged in addressing this issue and once everyone is there and they see the significance and the importance of um, addressing climate change i think everyone is going to be getting on board with it if you look back uh, you know, 20 years, 10 years ago, to numbers that we see today, there is a significant increase in engagement and increased awareness. And I think all that is as a result of that education uh, component. Okay, so awareness and education is going to be the key and, uh, for us to be able to mitigate uh, climate change as we develop new technologies. Uh, Spencer, in terms of... It's a Painful. That's for sure. Thank you. Spencer, in terms of what cities are, are doing to adopt uh, new standards to make changes uh, or to combat these changes, what can you elaborate on? Yeah, so right now there's really a lot of planning that's going on. Um, and, and, you know, I think the most concrete things that the local governments are doing uh, relate to again, seawall height and uh, stormwater uh, in, in other cases. So in the case, we've talked about seawall heights already, but you know, in the case of um, stormwater issues, uh, you have a lot of local governments that are reevaluating their stormwater systems and, and you know, creating new stormwater master plans. Um, you, you know, sort of the first step of this process is to prevent, um, the, the, the water, uh, the coastal waters from inundating the stormwater system and then flooding up through the streets. And so, um, you know, the sort of the first line of defense is to put check valves on the, on the outfalls of the stormwater system. Um, all of these, mo most of these stormwater systems that, that drain uh, the roadways uh, of, of the coastal areas here are gravity systems that basically just, um, you know, collect water and then drain into the closest um, coastal water body. And in the, in the urbanized areas of, um, 
Miami and Miami Dade County, you know, there's not a lot of, of pre treatment. So you get a lot of, um, you know, stormwater pollution in that, in that regard as well. So, so those, those sort of two things, I think, are, are the most concrete uh, examples of, of steps the local governments are taking beyond sort of their bigger and broader planning initiatives. Um, you know, in, in, with respect to those planning initiatives, you know, Miami-Dade County uh, was really the, the first down here to convene a sea level rise task force. And, and that sea level rise task force came out with uh, a bunch of recommendations. And then uh, the county ultimately adopted a resiliency plan as a result of that. Um, but again, not, not a whole lot of concrete steps beyond that have, have um, you know, have, have occurred, at least not in the capital improvement realm. Um, you know, Miami Beach as a municipality is probably a little more uh, forward uh, thinking and forward acting in terms of what it's done on the shoreline in terms of, um, you know, resilient shorelines. They've um, certainly designed a couple and are uh, working to apply for grant funding for one in particular, Brittany Bay Park, um, which is sort of a, a hardened shoreline that's designed to look like a living shoreline. Uh, and it's a, it's a really nice uh, project that Yannick and his firm, I think, are involved with. Um, in Miami, you know, uh, unfortunately, Miami has sort of lost um, some opportunities uh, for, for living shorelines. And I think just now they're, they're starting to really think about how they can incorporate uh, uh, living shoreline elements into uh, some of their, their hardening projects. And so, um, you know, the, a new project that I've just been talking to them about is taking place up at um, Morningside Park. And um, the city's really very interested in trying to design uh, a hardened shoreline there that is uh, elevated beyond which, uh, what, what's there today, but also something that incorporates um, mangroves and, um, you know, passive recreation opportunities and, and also uh, active recreation opportunities in terms of waterfront access, like kayak launches and things like that. So, um, you know, they've had a couple of projects in the works, one at Alice Wainwright Park, one at the Brickell Presbyterian Church, and another up at uh, Albert Pallet Park. All of these parks are on the bay and are either recently completed or in the process of being designed or constructed. And, um, you know, to date, really the direction that those projects have taken is just sort of a straight hardened seawall. Um, maybe some riprap out in the, in the water, but, but no, none of the other sort of living shoreline elements. And in addition to, um, you know, creating a nice um, atmosphere to enjoy and a, a preferable environmental benefit, um, you know, a lot of these projects that are designed as living shorelines can have significant cost benefits as well. Um, so, you know, I think, I think there's, been, there's been some action, but uh, we still have a long way to go. Okay, thank you. Janik, would you like to elaborate on this? Uh, sure. Um, one area that the county has also uh, been, been proactive, uh, I guess, as Spencer said, there's many areas in, in the early stages, but uh, uh, Miami Dade Parks have been uh, very proactive uh, in planning and also starting implementing some of these things. Uh, and one of the reasons is, uh, is probably that it may be easier for them to coordinate uh, some of those projects than for some other entities because uh, uh, the areas that they are operating are larger pieces of land. So the only, like many areas, they're the only ones that they have to coordinate with um, because that's really, like, once you get into like an urban environment, suddenly like if, once you move away from your seawall and you can put a minimum elevation there, uh, you suddenly start getting a lot of other people that you need to coordinate with. So like if you, uh, if you want to raise a road in, in one area, it start having a lot of, uh, of different um, domino effects and you try to solve one problem, but you may create uh, some other problems. So 
But Miami Days Parks has been uh, very, very um, proactive in, in this area. Uh, they have several projects in the works. That, like they're where they're uh, like they're, they're planning for their parks, what they have to do, but they are also implementing some of these projects too. Uh, and I think some of them also um, receiving funding from from fine, for example example that uh, uh, Spencer also is re representing uh, some of these waterfront uh, projects and uh, that also include like living shorelines and that. Um, and not, another area, uh, um, uh, Monroe County, uh, they start looking at their whole uh, road network because that's critical in the keys. Um, there's only one one way in and one way out, and uh, so they st started a study uh, last year, where they were looking at basically what is it going to cost uh, to raise all the roads uh, in the, that the county is uh, is uh, managing, and they quickly found out that that's going to be a lot not more money that they 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 probably have, uh, so they are uh, uh, trying to figure out basically what to do there. Uh, and what roads are more important, what areas are more important. Um, so, so that's like you know, another area where there's been, been some initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Janik. Um, I guess this question would be good for Mohammed. What are the plans from different cities around the country, around the world uh, regarding resilience and what are they doing uh, to mitigate? So if we look at, again, uh, if you look at resilience uh, in different countries, different cities, they're completely different. Some countries or cities do have problems in the water or they have extreme weather events, whether it's increasing precipitation, whether it's uh, tornadoes, some cities have earthquakes or countries do have earthquakes. Some countries do have heat, excessive heat or cities even We're talking about Arizona here in the US. So the problem itself should be addressed differently. So the resiliency aspect is very much the same. The framework should probably be the same, but the problem is def definitely different. And then when you think of the problem that's different, then definitely the tools and the way you address these problems are completely different. So there are different ways of how to think of it from a, a holistic perspective or a 6,000 feet perspective. And they always think of leadership and strategy. And a lot of my colleagues already talked about the connection of these and how that institutes and how the industry is actually in the forefront and taking it to the next level. I would really think of health and well-being. I would like to highlight that. There's a very big component in terms of how we think of a solution in terms of health and well-being and how individuals do react and act and get impacted by this extreme event. Uh, the infrastructure environment is another big component and then economy and society. You'd really just, from a bottom line, how would, you, how would you basically know if a city or a country is actually going through a great resilient plan? It's usually they, they have a target. So it's very much like academia. You say, if you get nine, above 90%, you get an A, above 80%, you get a B, and on, on, on. So that's kind of how cities and countries are creating their own targets or crafting their own targets. And based on their achieving these targets, then they say, okay, this city is resilient. This country is sustainable. As a matter of fact, they're not really resilient or sustainable. They're meeting their own guidelines or their, own, their main goals. And that, that, it keeps on changing. So when you put a target of 90% of achieving CO2 emission or like the architecture 2030, that was maybe 15 years ago or 10 years ago that was set and a lot of countries and cities approached it and try to pursue it, then they achieved it. And after 2030, then we have another target. And this is kind of how cities and countries are always evolving. They're always learning exactly how we're talking about it. It's all, it's all about education. It's all about continuous education. So even cities and countries do take the same path as individuals. As long as they work hand in hand, there's a lot of great examples. But if you think of all the countries, all the cities, they kind of focus on one main problem. So think of California, California is dealing with heat. They're dealing with increasing precipitation. They had a huge problem like 10 years ago and 15 years ago with increasing precipitation and the freeways, the I-10 completely collapsed. There was no connection between San Diego, between California. But, so it kind of completely destroys the whole infrastructure if you have just one heavy rainfall day. And if you see here in Miami, we have rain almost all year long. And we're just talking about the sea level rise. We're talking about how to kind of Make sure that the sea does not really 
get them onto our field. In other regions of the world, they're thinking, or in other cities, they're just thinking, how would I maintain my infrastructure? Their infrastructure is completely collapsed when, it, when there's in, increasing precipitation. Snow is another problem. Some cities do have problems in snow. So the way cities are attracting or trying to tackle this is completely different. Quality of water is another thing. If you think of African countries, they have a problem in quality of water. Not only connection to the water, the quality of the water they have throughout their systems is completely polluted. So the problem is it's a complete different ballgame. Suddenly, I just want to make sure the resiliency is maintaining clean water for our individuals. Here, we're lucky we're talking about how to make sure the water reaches every single utility. Plus, I don't want it to overflow. Actually, if you ask African countries, do you want it to overflow? They would say, yes, please, make it overflow. I want to reach that piece of water. I want to get water. So this is, that's how, again, when we started talking, education is a big component, and it's a very complex problem. But you can, you can solve one little part. And again, Jenik, Spencer, Jeff, and Asbar, we're, you solve one problem here, there's 10 other problems on the other side. So it's really hard to make sure all the problems are solved. It's not linear. It's, no way it's not linear. But at least it's incremental. So you, you solve one problem, then you jump to the next. And that's how cities are. And this is how we learn from other cities. So we want to make sure we, we do not have increasing precipitation, but we want to make sure that sea level rise is contained here. Do we want to make sure we have a strong infrastructure? We have never really explored a bridge that falls during hurricanes. How, how would people move around? So there's another dimension that can be added into cities. But as a matter of fact, here in the U.S., I think we're doing pretty good job as, as other countries. But again, we still have small problems that we want to deal. Again, we're trying to achieve perfectionism. We want to make sure we're very resilient and we're very sustainable in terms of the infrastructure should sustain itself and, and for a longer time and with all these different natural hazards. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we have a couple questions on the q and I'd like to pause for a second and try to answer some of these questions. Um, one of the questions that was raised is very interesting and it has to do with design. Uh, it's asking if we believe that future design will have to create sacrificial first floors. Since the floor, uh, since the flood elevation keeps rising, are we going to have to keep designing these sacrificial first levels? Uh, Jeff, what do you what do you think? Uh, you're muted, Jeff. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Can Can you hear me? Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you repeat that one more time, please? I want to make sure I get the question right. Sure. Do you believe we will have to design for sacrificial first floors? Well, that was funny because our group was talking about that. And as you know, time goes by and sea level rises keep rising up, you know, at some point the armament is going to reach where, you know, it's, it's not going to be obtainable in some low lying areas that you can sustain and do that. So, you know, when you look at larger cities and, and the structures and the buildings, there potentially could be the need for that. Now, the problem that I see with that is when you do have current buildings that are built, they were never designed to allow for that to happen. So there's all kinds of problems that can occur from that. And it's, I always kind of look at it like a patch quilt. You know, Fort Lauderdale has been mentioned several times about the sea level rise and a project that we're working on just down the street, which is a larger piece of a master plan that started 30 some years ago on the beach redevelopment of Fort Lauderdale. And it's the last remaining piece is the Los Olas. And there's a, a parking garage and it goes over the Los Olas Bridge. You know, that's one of the first ones when Fort Lauderdale passed uh, the ordinance to raise, the codes to raise the sea level, or the, the walls up to accommodate for the sea level rise. You're only really affecting though just that one area. And so then you've got, you know, the neighbor and the neighbor down the way and it continues on down. So. Uh, it's an interesting topic. I, I find it hard that, you know, and maybe somebody else on this panel that deals more architecturally can, but it, it's going to be something that, you know, 30, 40 years down the road, as if it continues at the rate that they say it's going to, we're going to have to address those issues because just 
adding a couple feet to sea level wall or to, to sea wall is not going to account for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do have another question here that is very interesting. Um, can you guys speak a little bit about uh, how we expect uh, the recent government funding and future anticipated government funding to help infrastructures and help and help uh, sustainability in construction? Uh, maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Esper. Uh, yes, Santiago, this is an interesting question, and I think it's it's. Um, a, um, again, there are a number of efforts in our community right now who are actually looking at this. So uh, one thing that emerges is that there are lots of funding opportunities uh, from the government or state government levels um, that um, is available for communities, especially local governments, um, to uh, address, uh, to use and address uh, some of the challenges they're having. I'm actually engaged in a project with one of our local communities. I don't want to name them during this session right now, but um, they are looking at a interesting way of, uh, and there was an earlier question we didn't tackle yet about the seawalls, how should we build, responsibility is it to build the seawalls so um, some communities are actually looking at generating funding programs that would enable their community stakeholders to benefit from the standardized uh, construction standards for a given community so uh, often we see that you may have a building that's under construction or it's a new project, they may build up to these new standards at an elevated seawall, elevated first floor level, but then they're adjacent, directly adjacent to an existing building, which is at a lower elevation and they have no funds to uh, improve their conditions. So some of our communities are teaming up with uh, private um, funding agents coupled with federal funding sources and grants, as well as funding opportunities from foundations um, to then incentivize the uh, development of unified wall systems or resiliency measures um, that will uh, have Uh, it looks like we lost you there, Dr. Esper. Collected from the community in the form of taxation uh, or other type of incentivized um, uh, grants. This type of deals or, or programs or, or model, and really going back to what Mohammed was saying earlier, how resiliency is quite different. Uh, in different regions of the world. While there are significant differences based on the challenges, the regulatory impact, the stakeholder engagement and participation, and the models used and developed to uh, address them can be similar. So what one community in one region does can certainly be modeled based on the needs of another community, even in other parts of the world. Thank you. I know Dr. Mohammed also wants to chime in on this. Okay, I'll just, before the, first of all, these two questions are brilliant questions. I'll try to answer, Jeff had a, an architecture kind of component in terms of, are we giving away the first floor? And that's when I start talking about innovation think of the solution should be very innovative it's not only architects it's not only engineers it's not it's all the stakeholders are we giving away the ground floors no that can be parks that can be common spaces they don't have to be parking garages they don't have to be wasted spaces so are we okay with a park that gets flooded when we have a hurricane yes we're okay with it are we okay with a building that gets completely destroyed if a hurricane shows up no so Think of the infrastructure systems. We can have parks underneath the first floor. We can have double heights that are beautiful, 
common spaces, kids' areas. We can have beautiful spaces. So that's kind of where innovation starts coming in. We never had garden roofs 20, 30 years ago. Now all the roofs do have gardens. So this is when innovation comes in. It's, it's not only about architects. It's about engineers. It's all about all the stakeholders. That's where everyone starts being innovative. That's when everyone tries to propose a solution. Again, it's called bottom line. Just, I'll talk a little bit about technical, a little bit about academic person, sorry. So when you talk about, there's something called fail safe, which is a factor of safety. All our buildings do have, when you as an engineer de design a beam or a structure or a wall or a concrete slab, there's a factor of safety. But in design, in basically infrastructure system or in the holistic landscape, there's something called safe to fail. Safe to fail means I'm okay with that structure. I'm okay with that component of the whole perspective to fail. But when it fails, it fails very safe. It doesn't have high likelihood of, it actually does have a high likelihood of failure. If it's a park, I'm okay with it to kind of get swamped with water. I'm okay with that. But low consequences of failure. That means no people die, no infrastructure gets destroyed and the like. But when you say fail safe, there's a low likelihood of failure. I don't want a building to fail. So that's why when the factor of safety comes in the equation in the structure, it's always safe. I don't want a bridge to fail. I don't want an infrastructure system or a, a building structure to fail, but the, it has a very high consequence. If a building fails, it's, it's a disaster. If a bridge fails, it's a disaster. So that's kind of where I think about it. So it's fail safe compared to safe to fail when it comes to resiliency and designing a sustainable solution. So that's, I just wanted to touch upon the first question just to give the people listening just basically a different perspective. It's not an easy answer. There's not a cookie cut answer. It's not a straightforward answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we have a, an excellent question next. Uh, how does fine decide uh, who local government grants, who gets uh, local government grants and how do they monitor the projects uh, they're getting done, Spencer? Okay, sorry, I had to unmute. Um, so yeah, how do we decide? So we have a, uh, a grant, an annual grant cycle and any local government that uh, abuts a natural navigable waterway uh, can apply uh, for funding. And in addition to local governments, we also have a program where state and federal government entities can apply like South Florida Water Management District, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, uh, US Fish and Wildlife, uh, those types of organizations. So. Um, the, the grant cycle opens in January. Uh, the applicants fill out the application. They propose a project. And then uh, we have a ranking uh, process where we, we assemble all the different applications. They're presented to us at a meeting in June every year. Actually, this year it's going to be in July because um, of the, the pandemic. We're delaying our, our meeting uh, by, a, by a month. Hopefully, we can do it in person by July. Um, but then, uh, all of the applicants come to that meeting and they, and they do five minute presentations on the proposed project. And then the board, uh, ranks all of those projects. So this year I just got my summary, uh, of the applicants today. We have 68 applications, um, from, you know, our district, our district encompasses all of the Atlantic coast of Florida from uh, Miami Dade to Nassau County. So each Atlantic Coastal County is a member of our district. And um, within that district this year, we have 68 projects. Um, Miami-Dade County specifically is asking for not the county itself, but uh, entities within the county, including the county and its cities, are asking for uh, somewhere in the nine, nine million range. And we have um, $7.6 million uh, to allocate to the county this year. So somebody won't, you know, isn't going to be selected. But, you know, the way that our program works is we, we really fund projects that are ready for construction. And so um, what happens is a lot of, we have a requirement that your project has to have permits by uh, mid-September of the year that you apply. 
And so typically what happens is some projects will get stuck in permitting and they won't, you know, they won't have their permits in time. So even though we have uh, an excess request, um, hopefully this year, you know, things will work out. Um, so that's, that's basically the way we, we select those, um, those grants. We, we rank them every year. Is there a second part? I can't remember. Uh, yes. The second part is how do you guys, uh, make sure that the project gets done? Uh, oh yeah. How do we monitor it? So, so we have a grant agreement with, um, anyone that we disperse funds to and the grant agreement has requirements for, um, you know, basically pub public access is a big component of that. Our, our projects uh, that we fund are required to provide uh, public access uh, because that's really the basis for this grant program is to get the public closer to the water. Uh, maybe not into the water, although we always promote that, but closer to the water in the form of uh, bay walks and river walks and certainly boat ramps and marinas are, are squarely within our programs too. And so those grant agreements uh, really are, are very helpful in the future as they, as they govern, um, you, you know, uh, the, the use of that property for a long time. So, um, you know, you, you may have heard of, of some efforts to, you know, locally here to like fill in the FEC slip um, in Museum Park near the, the American Airlines Arena uh, and not to like get into like a specific issue, but you know, we have, uh, we funded a lot of um, work at Museum Park on those seawalls, uh, over $6 million. And so, um, and, and the purpose of those grants was to provide public access to the water. And so if all that area is filled in, you know, our lawyers on the district have looked at it and said, look, that's not the intent for which we provided this fund. So, you know, that's the type of action that would have to, that would trigger the clawback. And so if, if the local government's grant agreement is violated, uh, we have the ability to go back and, uh, you know, recapture the funding that we have provided for the project uh, if it's not being used for, for what we gave the money for. Thank you. Yeah, so we are definitely seeing more uh, private-public partnerships uh, when it comes to this space. And looks like we are already coming into an hour into this panel. Um, I have one more question for all of you, which let's start with Jeff, is uh, how have you seen the topic of resilience evolve over your career? Well, I, I kind of start that, you know, as, as a landscape architect and what we do, we've always kind of been stewards of the land. So it's been kind of nice over the last 15, 20 years that, you know, uh, the, the discussion of how to become more resilient, whether you're in Florida or in the middle part of the states. But I think what's really happened and it, it to me, kind of really started clicking was back when LEED was uh, became formulated with Al Gore and various other people and you know they started laying down a challenge or trying to create a group that then kind of fostered a lot of change in the way in which we think and we design things and trying to find credits and, and opportunities to become better stewards of the land. So that, that's been a, a big change. I think the other thing as of more recent is a lot of on the development side, on the private side, you're starting to get a lot of people that become more stewards of the land on that as well too. And they understand the importance of it, what value it brings to their property and the, you know, the design vision or whatever it is that they're trying to, to develop or sell. So that's been, I think probably over the last three to five years has been probably one of the more welcoming things that I've seen. So. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, how about yourself? Uh, I personally think the word sustainability and resiliency did not exist maybe 25 years ago. <laughs> so I think we're, 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 we're taking it to the next level. And I think we're on the right track. Uh, I think what all the problems we've seen around us with how the world is evolving, a lot of people are now, all the stakeholders, regardless of who they are, even like now we're talking about students, we're talking about school kids, everyone is talking about CO2 emissions, sea level rise, increasing precipitation, excessive heat. So all these different problems of climate change, they're already embedded in schoolwork, in universities, even in professional and stakeholders. And again, what Jeff said is spot on. It's, 
it's, it's value. If, if the developer understands the value of being sustainable and resilient, then most probably that's the force that would take the city or the infrastructure to become more resilient and sustainable. It's, it's not only a top-down decision, it has to come bottom up as well. So it's, it's a multi-dimensional way of looking at it. And I think throughout my past 20, 25 years, I, and I, when I was taking my undergrad, that was never something that I thought of. And I'm not, I'm not really old, but it was not there. Sustainability was not there. And again, LEED is very young. And now we're talking about living building challenge. So there's another way of certification or getting our buildings more sustainable. And where there are roads, envision, so there's another certification for infrastructure systems. So it's not only buildings. All the different aspects of infrastructure is actually trying to be more sustainable and more resilient, which is, for my own perspective, I think it's music to my ears. I love sustainability, I've been in it, and I think everything should be sustainable. So I think it's great. Thank you, thank you. Uh, how about you, Dr. Esper? Well, I'm, I'm with Mohammed there um, in what he just uh, summarized, but I want to add that, you know, several years ago, many years ago, resilience wasn't really a topic at all. We started this actually with more focus on uh, sustainability. Uh, so many, many years ago, uh, increased awareness or emphasis started merging out of sustainability concepts but uh, even when we were talking about sustainability we were not as multi-dimensional uh, as we are today often we were focused on energy alone for example or we were focused on water but i think something that is um, certain emerging necessities or challenges or problems that we're facing uh, necessitated this sudden step forward and increase in um, you know our progress in this area but also I think innovation technological advancements um, are really key contributors to this success or new success hopefully for example availability of new materials as resources for construction sector. We talked about should we build first floors that could be underwater and Mohammed ex uh, expanded on that a little bit. And, um, but now today's thinking is, can we use materials that can be submerged and uh, will be resilient underwater in, in adverse environmental conditions? Or um, can we use materials in construction processes that in the event that buildings are underwater, are not actually ending up contributing as a hazardous uh, or adversely impacting the environmental or ecological health of, of our uh, surroundings. So, innovation availability of technological advancements new materials emergence of new materials methods all that it has contributed significantly to how fast we are now gaining ground in these areas and hopefully we'll continue to do so i think our success really now depends on how uh, widespread um, we can adapt some of these uh, thinking and how on the regulatory or policy side, um, you know, these efforts also be well received and, and gain ground. And, you know, some of them, we had a question about the, the, you know, the list before, permitting often is a big challenge. How long does it take to permit a project? How long does it take to permit a project that is not conventionally designed? So these are all issues, but LEED starting several years ago, if you look at the first versions of LEED and compare that to codes, take our Florida building code, a lot of the LEED initiatives now are code. They're mandated in the code. So that helped, you know, cross, you know crossing that, uh, bridging that gap there. So. Um, we need more of that in years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Esper. Uh, what about you, Janet? How does uh, resiliency uh, evolve throughout your career? Um, well, 
how, uh, how my field has been like the coastal and, and marine engineering. So we've somewhat always had to deal with the impacts from the ocean and uh, adapt to impacts. So we've been involved in, in like vulnerability studies. Um, yeah, I've been that my entire career for, for 20 years. Uh, so where, where I see the change is that it's gotten a lot more interest. Whereas uh, 15 years ago, it was something you, you more had to really convince your client that you needed to do. Uh, now uh, is something that they also come and ask for. Um, like, what what is going to happen to our property in 20 years and that kind of thing? And what's going to happen if there's a hurricane? So that's uh, that's how we've seen it. Um, then, uh, in terms of our work, then where we've uh, where we've been more focused, maybe just on on uh, like 15 years ago, on just working our own little area, we have to work a lot more with our discipline and understand them a lot more. Uh, so it comes back to what's been said in this panel here too, and, and that it requires like an understanding of a lot of different areas. And if you just look at the panels here with five different people that are all touching on very different things of uh, resiliency, uh, and that's the projects that we work on now is like that, that we need a lot of collaboration between uh, between all the different disciplines because we may come up with a solution, but that may trigger something else. Uh, so so that's been, uh, uh, that, that's also been, been a change. And then lastly, uh, then we have to look at more uh, at, 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 uh, at adaptation and uh, flexibility in our design, uh, as Dr. Esper just mentioned relative to material, uh, if if suddenly we, if we're working on something, we have to think about what are the conditions going to be for, for that component in 30 years. So we have to start uh, looking at those like changing conditions. So that's where I've seen the, the, the changes. Thank you. Uh, and Spencer, to close out, uh, tell us about how it's affected your career and how it's evolved. Yeah. Um... You know, I think when I started this, any kind of marine and coastal work was really related to docks or marinas and beach nourishment. Uh, and now uh, beach nourishment, as I mentioned, is still a very important part of resiliency and, and certainly is something that needs to be focused on and not lost with all of this other stuff that's going on. Um, but, but, you know, now uh, th there's much more of a focus on, um, you know, new and different types of shorelines and components that, that were really not, not talked about a lot in the past. Um, I, I think it's a really great um, area to work. I think it's a great field to be in. And certainly if I was a student, uh, it's something I would look very closely at because, um, you know, if the, 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 historical geologic trends show that you know sea level will continue to rise in Florida as it has done over the millennia and uh, this is a problem that's not going away and so we're you know we're going to be forced to face it and I think there's going to be a lot of money that's uh, thrown at this and a lot of opportunity for uh, professionals in this field so uh, thank you very much I would like to Take a moment to thank the panelists for taking your time. I know we all live pretty busy lives and uh, especially right now there's this quarantine, this is probably a good uh, getaway from your daily routine. Uh, and I also would like to thank all the participants and for the questions you submitted. Uh, and I hope you guys can join us on our next uh, CTBUH meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Santiago. Thanks everyone, thank great to see you. Thank you thank for inviting me and organizing it. Thank you all.